Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you that by your word and your spirit working in us, you are making us more and more into the image of Christ. That you are sanctifying us in the truth. Your word is truth. So I ask this morning that your spirit would be um, pricking our hearts with your word, that it would be, excuse me, that he would be um, at work in our lives, that he would give us eyes to see and ears to hear and minds to believe. I'm in trust that what you have said is good, that it is right, that it is for our best, um, and that you are in control of our lives um, so that when we submit to you and do as you ask, um, you bring great blessing and you bring us founded hope in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, give us grace this morning, we pray, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we come to a transition in 1 Peter this week. Um, I think it's helpful for us to make note of it here as we start. Um, so far, Peter has spoken truth statements mostly um, to his readers. Not that they're mostly truth, but they're mostly statements. Um, he tells them what God has done. Um, he get, declares the gospel in clear terms. This is who you are because this is what Jesus has done for you. This is what the Father has done on your behalf. This is what the Spirit is doing. And we call these um, statements of truth indicatives. Um, you can have a little grammar lesson this morning. Indicatives are statements. They're verbs that make statements. Um, and God makes these statements of truth. And for the most part, the first half of First Peter is indicative statements. It's those kind of, of phrases. He writes, you'll remember at the very beginning, to the elect exiles who are elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in the sanctification of the, of the Spirit unto obedience and the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Peter told us in verse 3 of chapter 1, that God has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We learned that God is holy and that he has made us to be a holy priesthood. By his work we are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. We are now God's people. And now, as we transition, we come to verse 11 of chapter 2, we come to the imperatives. Okay, our, back to our grammar lesson. Imperatives are commands, right? Um, Peter tells us what to do. Go, eat, run, sleep, lie down, eat your vegetables. These are all things that we tell mostly children to do. Um, but they're imperatives, they're commands. Um, and Peter gives us some imperatives from God in this section. He tells us to abstain from the passions of the flesh, to keep our conduct honorable, to submit to every human institution, um, and lots more things that we are to do. So there's indicatives and imperatives. So is Peter saying, God is holy, you are not holy, you should be holy, therefore be holy, just do it. Be holy. Pull up your bootstraps. Work harder. Do it. Is this what we might call Nike Christianity? Just do it. No. If that was true, then the claims that he has upon us for us to submit and to do his will would be impossible. We cannot do it on our own. But Peter here, as all the New Testament writers do, he motivates his readers and he motivates us to obey these imperatives based on the indicatives. The imperatives come after. Gospel obligations come in light of gospel declarations. They go hand in hand, and the declarations always come first. The gospel obligates us to think and to feel and to act in certain ways because of or in light of the gospel, what he has declared about us. So, in light of our status as God's people in the world, a chosen race, royal priesthood, holy nation, what does Peter tell us to do? I've titled this lesson this morning, if you care to have a title, How to Live Holy Lives. Because Peter is saying this statement, because you are holy, I told you that, because that's who you are, this is how you are to live. Because God made you holy, and now he's going to tell you how to live that out in the world. So first, in verses 11 through 12, 
we have general principles. Um, Peter addresses his readers first with affection. Notice that he says, beloved. Beloved. We are beloved by God. His readers are beloved by Peter. He is urging them to holy living with affection. He calls them this because he has earnest love for them. Remember 122. Peter told us to love each other from a sincere heart with a brotherly love. Peter has this kind of love for his readers, um, and we should for one another. It's with an overflow of love that he brings God's truth to bear upon the church. He commands God's people to live holy lives. But love that is truly love finds its source in the truth. And the truth that Peter's going to state is, Beloved, I urge you, as sojourners and exiles, remember that's who we are, to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among you Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Because you are loved by God, by me, Peter, do these things. God's love has been displayed immeasurably, but it is not just displayed for the sake of knowledge. The love of God through which he has made us his people, the holy nation, royal priesthood, that love obligates us to obey him. It compels us to live as he desires. So remember, as Peter reminds us here, we are living in this world as sojourners and exiles, strangers and aliens, citizens of another world, which is heaven, um, which is pretty awesome. We don't have the rights and privileges of this land. We have the rights and privileges of that land where our true citizenship lies. And the rights and privileges of citizenship in heaven are certain things, um, and they come with certain duties um, to our king because he is our ruler. So with this strange dichotomy in place that we're citizens of heaven while also living on the earth, Peter tells us what to do. And first, he addresses the desires of believers. He's going to talk about our passions of our flesh. And then he addresses our conduct. So first, let's look at the desires. Chapter 2, verse 11. Abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Notice that this first command has nothing to do with our circumstances, with things external to us. He says, you believers, you still battling sin, look into your own soul and don't give way to the flesh. Paul has said last week that circumstances do not impede our spiritual growth. Sin does. Our desires originate not from outside of us, but from within. James gives us a poignant warning um, in James chapter 1, where he tells us about our own desires. He writes, Each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully, fully grown, brings forth death. Kind of a big deal, right? Death is what comes with our sinful passions. So what are these passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul? Anything that is of an unredeemed nature is the passions of your flesh. Anything. Paul gives us a list in Galatians chapter 5 of particularly, um, or excuse me, of particular fleshly desires to avoid. So he writes in Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21, Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. Now, we look at this list, and you're not me and I'm not you, so I don't know what you do with it. Um, but I tend to look at this list and say, well, you know, I'm not doing so bad. I'm a faithful wife. I don't bow down to idols. I seek unity in the body. I've never been drunk and there's no orgies in the books. 
I'm doing all right. Look how good I'm doing. But I can't think this way. Because remember, anything that's of an unredeemed nature is the passions of my flesh, which are waging war against my soul. So when Peter calls us to be citizens of heaven, to abstain from the passions of the flesh, he calls us to be holy as God himself is holy. To throw off, as Hebrews writes, every weight and sin which so easily entangles us. Every thought of the flesh is hostile to God. The passions of this flesh belong to this world. And remember, you don't belong here. When I live in this world as if I am a citizen of it, I teach my mind, or simply default to allowing my mind, right, if I'm not thinking rightly, I teach my mind to look around me and to agree with the world, to agree with and love what the world screams at me will satisfy. And when I do that, my soul is at enmity with God. I become entangled by the flesh. God doesn't tell us that sin so easily entangles because it's like, you know, a free-flowing something that, like, is really nice and pretty. It entangles. Remember um, Sherry's example about girding up your loins. you got to get your skirt out of the way so you can run, right? That's what sin does. It's like this big, heavy garment all wrapped around your legs when you're trying to run. It trips you up and makes you fall because it easily entangles. The scriptures tell us that, that sin is enmity with God. And enmity, y'all, enmity is hatred to the point of murder. That is how I treat my Savior when I give in, when I don't battle the temptations of the flesh. But when I live as a stranger in this world, which is who I really am, I'm not in bondage to the flesh. I'm just passing through. So, let's see if we can illustrate this point. Who here has ever played Monopoly? <laughs> see, y'all are so good. Um, my most recent Monopoly playing happened with um, five-year-old Maggie Huss, and let me tell you, it's really hard to play Monopoly with a five-year-old. Um, but um, I love Monopoly, only sort of, it's kind of a long game, but um, in one corner of the Monopoly board is a square where either Life is just fine, or life is terrible. And what is it? The jail, right? There are two options on this piece. I can either be in the jail, right? Or just visiting, okay? If I'm in jail, if I'm actually behind these bars, if I'm a citizen here, I am bound in chains. I can't get out unless something happens to let me free. Either I have to wait for three turns, or I have to roll doubles or something, or I have to draw a card that says get out of jail free. Something like that, right? But if I belong here, I'm stuck until something happens. But if I'm just visiting, I'm just passing through. The chains here have no hold on me when I land on this square because I don't belong in the jail. It's not my home. I'm just passing through. I roll the dice and I keep on moving because I'm not a citizen there. I do not belong there because I am free. So why is it such a big deal that I live as a stranger, as a visitor, when I'm just passing through this world? Well, because Peter tells us that the passions of the flesh wage war against my soul. The desires of the flesh seek your destruction. They lead to death whenever you consent to them. And how careless I am with my flesh's desires. I do my very best to avoid all harm to my physical body. I tread carefully on wet ground. I lock my doors. I obey the traffic lights. I respect the sharp knives in my kitchen. I use proper safety when operating power tools. I don't blow dry my hair while standing in water like the warning tells me, right? Because it says warning could cause death. So I don't do that. I avoid all enemies from without that pose danger to my life. Yet, 
when it comes to my soul. I not only carelessly allow danger, but I stick my neck out to the enemy. I consent to harm. And how do I do that? You're probably not going to like these. But I say, here, anti-God TV show, you can fill my mind with godlessness and sinful thoughts. Here, magazine, you can introduce lust for sexual pleasure, Cosmopolitan, 17. Or even, perhaps something more tame. Here, magazine, you can introduce envy for someone else's home. Good old Southern living or better homes and gardens. Now, is there something wrong with Southern living? No. But if that's going to feed the passions of my flesh, if that's going to cause me to envy and strife and dissensions, then I should put it in the garbage. Because it's feeding the passions of my flesh, which are waging war against my soul. They are anti-God. One more. I say, here, radio. This is a big one with the kids. Here, radio. You can fill my memory bank with ideas and acts and feelings and words. And what do the acts and feelings and words that come across the radio stream do? Y'all, they mock my Savior. They mock what he's done for me. They mock what he's called me to do. Um, and that is enmity against God. And I don't want that. But it's so easy. But I should turn it off. These things may seem trivial, but the scriptures tell us otherwise. The passions of your flesh wage war. I know I keep saying it. Wage war against your soul. There's a group, um, I am not a music junkie, my husband is a music junkie, um, and there's a group called the Oh Hellos that are a Christian group, and they're kind of like, you know, hipstery and whatever, um, but they sing a song called Eat You Alive that um, Matthew is always playing because it's really good, um, and these are the words um, that I think illustrate this well. The words say this, he said to me, child, I'm afraid for your soul. These things that you're after they can't be controlled. This beast that you're after will eat you alive and spit out your bones. She'll string you along and she'll sell you a lie, but there's nothing but pain on the edge of a knife. There is no courage in flirting with fear to prove you're alive. I've seen the true face of the things you call life. The voice of the siren that holds your desires. But death, she is cunning and clever as hell, and she'll eat you alive. Oh, she'll eat you alive. The things of this world, of the flesh, they seek your destruction. The devil is not fine with your commitment to Christ. He hates God and he hates his people. He comes as an angel of light. Isn't this wonderful? But he's really a prowling around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Knowing the deceitfulness of sin and the destruction that it brings, what should we do? We must trust in the sovereignty of God and his perfect goodness. Trust that he is working in all power to bring about our greatest good. And we must trust that what he says is good is actually so. Remember the TV show Early edition. Does anybody remember that show? Yes. It came on after Touched by an Angel. Um, so what happened in early edition is the guy got tomorrow's newspaper today. So what did he know? All the bad stuff that was going to happen. He knew who was going to die, who was going to be in a car accident, um, if somebody was going to you know, do a terrorist attack, whatever it was. He knew what was going to happen today because he got tomorrow's newspaper. So what did he do? He tried to stop it. He tried to save people. He set out to stop evil from ravaging his city. If we could read ahead what would harm us or what would kill us, what decisions would make life harder or make life easier or better, what would bring joy and what would bring sorrow, wouldn't we be anxious to get to reading so that we could avoid crisis and have joy? We have tomorrow's newspaper. God has given it to us in his word. 
Now it's not going to give you the printout of exactly what to do. It's not um, a list. But Peter will tell us in his second epistle that God has granted to us everything that we need for life and godliness. He has told us in his word how to avoid death. Abstain from the passions of your flesh, which wage war against your soul. This is the way to holiness. And not just to holiness, but to satisfaction and to everlasting joy. It's not just how to avoid the bad things, but how to gain the good things. Um, because those go together. So next, Peter addresses the conduct of Christians. He's dealt with our heart, in a sense. Um, and now he's going to deal with our actions in verse 12. I promise I'm like camping out on 11 and 12, y'all, but the rest of it I'll go through pretty quickly. Um, so how are we to be holy in our actions? Well, we're citizens of another world, but in the strange turn of events, we live here as citizens, as, you know, flesh and blood people um, on the earth, in our mortal lives, in the dash between our birth and our death. Um, we are American citizens, um, for the most part. I don't see anybody that I know is not an American citizen here. Um, God commands us to live as God's people in our society, in the place um, that we actually live. Why? Well, on an obvious point, because we are God's people and we live here. Um, but there's more to it. The lives of believers serve as a living testimony of the gospel of Jesus Christ in the world. They serve as a living testimony of the love and mercy and grace of God to ordinary men and women. To show people that don't believe what it looks like to be a believer. What it looks like to get rid of um, the sinful things that wreak havoc on our lives um, and to live in a, in a way that is truly life. So when, other when unbelievers look into your life, what do they see? Do they see Jesus? Kiss Mocker illustrates this verse by saying that Christians are living in glass houses. They are on display for the world to see. God has called us to live in this world so that others might see Jesus. Remember the words of Jesus in Matthew 5. You, believer, are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all the house. In this same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. God could have chosen a system of salvation where we are justified and instantly taken to be with him in glory, which is a weird thought. Um, but he could have done that if he wanted to, but he didn't. He chose to bring salvation to men and women and then to use those men and women as spokesmen for his glory, as ambassadors of grace, as bringers of the gospel of peace. You live this out every day for people outside your home, but think about it. You also live it out every day for your spouse and for your children. How do children, the majority of them, come to know Jesus? It's their mom and dad, right? Because you're the one that's telling them about Jesus, about what it looks like to be a Christian, um, about how wonderful God is. Because God set it up that way for you to be the ambassador of Christ to the world. And the world starts in your very home when you bring little children who are sinners into the world and they need Jesus. And you get to be the hands and feet of Jesus to them. Paul says, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. This is not just Matthew Eichert and David Sinclair. It's you preaching the good news through your words and through your life. Now, in living honorable lives, in laboring to live without sin, in holiness, those who would speak against us may investigate our lives and find there no evil by which to accuse us, but rather the gospel by which they may be saved. Our lives should be, let our lives be so full of Jesus, so full of debt to mercy, 
that unbelievers may investigate, that they can do an NCIS inquiry with all the forensic evidence and everything and dig into every little piece of our lives. Look through our glass houses and find truth there, abundant with grace, and become obedient to God, glorifying Him on the day that He visits them in their own conversion. Now, does this mean smile all the time? Live perfectly so there's no tears and no pain and no sorrow and no nothing wrong. It can't be. It mustn't be. Because we know that God has given us life and he's called us to live it in this sin-stained world. Where sin and death are not, you know, things to be glossed over or swept under the rug, but are very, very real. Peter calls us to live holy lives so that we are dependent upon the Spirit, to mourn with those who mourn, to rejoice with those who rejoice, to lean upon Jesus for strength, to obey his will, and to ever return to repentance and faith. It is not a testimony to, believer, to unbelievers when we sin and then say, oh, sorry, like I need to put my smile back on. But it's a testimony to unbelievers when we sin to our children and in front of the unbelievers say, I was wrong. I am sorry. Please forgive me. Demonstrating gospel living is not slapping smiles in hardship or sin, but enduring hardship with joy, looking to the reward of our faith and glory, facing sin with sorrow and humility, with repentance and turning, seeking to, as the writer of Hebrews says again, lay aside every weight, and do what? Run with endurance the race that is set before you, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of your faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of God. As we seek to obey God and live holy lives, Peter then turns from these general principles to give a specific application of what it looks like to live our survey out our salvation in the world. We're going to talk about these applications through the end of Peter because they're going to take us all the way until he gives his little I, Peter, grace and peace part. Um, application, the whole rest of the book is going to be that way. So here today, we see just one application of what these general principles tell us to do. In verses 13 through 17, Peter tells us to submit to human institutions. He says, Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. So our first application. Part of living honorable lives before unbelievers is rendering obedience to human authority, to those who have been given positions of authority over you. You will remember that in Romans 13, Paul called believers to be subject to governing authorities because they, the governing authorities, are instituted by God himself. For there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by him. One way the Christians keep their conduct honorable among the pagans is by subjecting themselves for the Lord's sake to governing rulers. So Peter is telling us in no uncertain terms that God, the maker of the world, and the father of his people has given us the government. He did not leave man in a state of doggy dog or survival of the fittest like the animal kingdom. He gave us human institutions. And human institution means institutions appropriate to humans. Those established for the punishment of evil and the praise of the good to provide order and rule and regulated society. The government is a good thing. It gives us traffic lights. They're for the good of society so that people can get around town, right? There's lots more to it than that, but that's a, like a small example. But it regulates human life in such a way um, that it promotes good um, and punishment of evil. 
Now, Peter uses the verb be subject. Some of your Bibles may say submit. Um, and those two words are interchangeable. They really do mean be subject or submit. Um, he's telling us to place ourselves under or to obey what is over us. Now, we don't really like submission, do we? Let's be honest. We didn't like it when we were kids and our parents said, eat your vegetables. Unless you like vegetables. I like vegetables. Um, we don't like it when we're behind a school bus and the rotating stop sign comes out and we're like, oh, I'm kind of in a hurry. But we have to submit to authority, right? Because that's the authority. The stop sign says you can't go past the school bus when it's letting off children. We don't like it when we're being lazy. And our husband, maybe it's just mine, says you really need to get up now. This doesn't happen very often, but it happened the other day. And my response is, I know that! Enter the whining and griping excuses. Why? I, I did know that I needed to get up. Why was it such a bother that he told me that? I know he's right. He is being an agent of truth for my good. But I hate it because I don't want to submit to authority. I like my sin better. Don't you? Could be just me. <laughs> I think it's probably not. Um, but that submission is part of the passions of my flesh, right? Because I, don't, I like my flesh better. But that is sinful, obviously. The Lord tells me to submit to authority. Submission does not mean that you lose your dignity or identity or the ability to make decisions. But rather in submission, we recognize and acknowledge the authority that God has instituted. When we submit to the authorities in our lives, in this particular case to governmental institutions, we uphold that God is sovereign over every area of life. He is in full control of the government. Nothing has happened. No governor has ever come to sit in his seat without God's will. We also like to question authority. What gave you the right to tell me what to do? We see this most blatantly with children. I remember one time, um, not picking on you, Missy, I was at the Huss's house, and Branton, I told him to do something, and he said, why should I do that? I said, hmm, probably because your mom's out of town and I'm in charge, so do it. You know, like, I, I am the authority. That is why you have to do it. Because your mom left me in charge of you. But we like to question it. It's not just kids, we do it too. Um, they just vocalize it. The objection though to authority is unbiblical. Remember again Romans 13. There is no power that anybody has except God. So if anybody has power over you, that power came from God. God alone rules men and nations. He gives the power of the sword and he takes it away as he pleases. Therefore, we are subject to it. Now, in case we look at Peter's exhortation to submit and we say, yes, that's good advice, but you don't know my governor or my senator or my president or my Supreme Court. Let us recall the life and times of Peter's ruler, the one and only Emperor Nero. Now, I did a little bit of research because I feel like sometimes historical things get a little skewed. I mean, we tend to think people did things that they didn't do, but it turns out it's true. Nero ruled beginning AD 54. He was um, 14. No, he was 17. He ruled for 14 years from the age of 17 until he was 31 um, when he killed himself. And between those years, he ruled in wickedness, in evil, and in hatred of Christians. He blamed them for evil they did not do, um, and he tortured them. It is true, the stories, that he had them dipped in oil and burned on poles in order to light his garden at night. This is Peter's ruler. He's the emperor. If we base his worthiness to rule on his conduct, Nero would not be a legitimate ruler, but he was the emperor, and Peter recognized his office 
and he tells Christians to submit to him. It's kind of crazy, but it's true. We are not different, though we are removed 2,000 years. Though our government may stand in the way of sinners, it may mock God's ordinances and rule without equity and justice. The government is in the place under the power of God Almighty. We may act with all of our might to rally for truth, to change the tide of malice towards God's principles, to stop the murder of unborn children and those who are defenseless. Yes, fight to make right what men do wrong. Yet, we must heed the words of Scripture. Listen well as Calvin responds to the objection with, with these words. I think it's really poignant. Calvin says, It may be objected here that kings and other magistrates often abuse their power and exercise tyrannical cruelty rather than justice. To this I answer that tyrants and those like them do not do such things by their abuse without the ordinance of God still remaining in force. Just as the perpetual institution of marriage is not subverted even though the wife and the husband behave in an unseemly way, marriage is still as God has said it is. However men may go astray, the end fixed by God is unchanged in its place. Jesus himself submitted to Pilate, and he said, You would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given to you from above. Now, Peter doesn't leave us without explanation as to why we should submit. He writes in verse 15, For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Good works silence the accusations of evil. Think about, this is maybe the opposite illustration, but think about, you know, you're on the phone with somebody and you say, um, yeah, my, my mom's not here. And your mom yells from the background, hey, Sally! Like, I just told somebody you weren't here. Like, it shuts you up, right? When somebody proves that, that there's no accusation. You can, it doesn't work that way. When somebody does something true while you're lying, they are shut up. Um, and the opposite is true as well. Um, if you are telling something, saying something bad about someone, and then they're right there in your face proving that it's not true, that they're in fact doing good. It shuts up the accusation of the person who is trying to do evil against you. Remember earlier Peter said to live honorable lives so that when pagans speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God. Here again Peter tells us that God's will is that we do good. For in doing good, God restrains the evil speech of unbelievers. That is the way God has intended it to be. The term Peter uses for silencing here is like muzzling an animal. When pagans see our good works, they are literally reduced to silence. They cannot speak um, because it's not true. Now, this doesn't mean that nobody will slander you. Um, the eminent theologian Taylor Swift reminds us that don't you worry your pretty little minds. People throw rocks at things that shine. People will still slander you. People will still speak evil against you. Unbelievers slander God's people and God himself because they are foolish and they speak ignorance. Paul tells us that the cross of Christ is foolishness to those who are perishing. They do not know God. Their hearts are hard and their minds are warped and defiled by sin, so that truths are lies and lies are truth to them. We cannot expect unbelievers to act like believers, but we should expect believers to act like believers. Why should we bother then to live good lives for the sake of pagans? They don't deserve that we act in lovely ways on their behalf for their good. They hate God. They're pagans. But we must. Because God has made it his will 
that they should be silenced by our conduct and even brought to repentance and faith. So what is there to doing good? Peter writes, live as free people, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, and honor the emperor. Freedom, liberty, oh, how we love these words. We're Americans, y'all. How we long for freedom from obligations and from duty and from restraint. But ladies, freedom from obligations and duty and restraint is not biblical freedom. Biblical freedom is that I am free from the power of sin and death. I am free from slavery to anything that promotes evil. I am free to serve my God and to serve his church. God gives his people freedom so that they can obey. We are free, as Kistemacher says, without any fear, as long as we serve God in absolute obedience. Calvin writes that we obtain liberty in order that we may more promptly and readily obey God. God has set us free so that sin may no longer have dominion over us, and so that we may become obedient to righteousness. If we say, I am free, and then use that freedom to act in a way that does not advance the cause of Christ, we have become slaves again to sin. We use our status as free to cover up our evil, to benefit our own glory in taking freedom to do our own will. If I use my freedom to do my will, and my will is not God's will, then I'm just sinning again because I'm trying to advance my own kingdom. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free, not that we fall again into slavery to sin and death, but that we may take hold of that which is truly life, life in Jesus Christ. William Cooper wrote a hymn called Love Constraining to Obedience. In it he penned um, several stanzas, but these two I think are fitting here. He says, To see the law by Christ fulfilled, to hear his pardoning voice, changes a slave into a child, and duty into choice. He says, Then all my servile works were done, a righteousness to raise. Now freely chosen in the Son, I freely choose his ways. The love of Christ grants me sweet freedom and calls my soul to sweet obedience because he is my Father. Now before we close this morning, I want to return us to the indicatives and the imperatives of the beginning. As we talk about these commands to abstain from evil and to live honorable lives and to submit to human institutions, it can be easy to fall into the mindset that we must do all of these things by God's command by pulling up our bootstraps. And in pulling up my bootstraps, you probably fall into one of two categories. I can find that either in doing what God has said, that I find a reward for my labor, righteousness earned, love of God gained, right standing before the Father, because look how well I obeyed. This is my default of sin, I'm self-righteous. But you might not be like me. You might be more despairing over your sin and fall into the other category, which is a great despair for my failure. Look at what God has said that I, did, I should do. But I, righteousness was not achieved. Love of God is lost. Right standing before God is unattainable because look how poorly I obeyed. I want to be clear this morning that God's call for us to perfect obedience, it is there. But our obedience, never perfect, will never make us right before God. In sin did my mother conceive me. It is true. Our justification is found in Christ alone. But isn't that a wonderful place for justification to be found because he's so much better than me? Justification is an act. It's something God does. It's an act of God's free grace where he pardons all our sins and accepts us as righteous in his sight, 
only for the righteousness of Christ imputed to us and received by faith alone. Now, does this pardons all our sin mean only those sins committed yesterday? No, of course not. He pardons all my sin. Those I committed yesterday, those I'm committing right now, and those I'm going to commit in the future until I die and I'm made perfect in glory. Does the accepts us as righteous in his sight mean only until I screw up royally again? No. I am forever righteous in Christ. Jesus grants me his righteousness. He says, I am saved from sins and judgment that comes for them. God sits in the courtroom of judgment. He slams his gavel down and he declares in all officialness, with no power above him to overrule, not guilty. My filth no longer exists in his presence. The robes of Christ are mine. When God the Father in his role as judge looks at me, he will only and always see Jesus. No wrath can ever go over him or under him or around him to get to me. Only Jesus, he stands in my place. I stand holy before a holy God. The righteous life of Jesus lived is credited to me as if I accomplished it all. When God goes down the lifts of his perfect laws, at each one, he puts a check mark with my name on the top. Done. 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 You could say done all day because they are accomplished. I, Rachel Eicher, did these things? Yes. I am in Christ. I belong to him. His life is mine. Jesus kept the law, the law in Christ fulfilled, and he credited them to me. He said, I did them for you on your behalf. They are complete. So if this is true, which it is, how can God say, do these things now? Abstain from the passions of your flesh. Live holy lives. Submit to the governors. Honor everyone. Fear God. Love the brotherhood. How can he demand that I obey? I already obeyed. I did all the checklists because Jesus gave that to me. It is because God desires me to be experientially in my actual life what he has made me forensically by declaring with that gavel that I am not guilty and I am righteous. God as judge accepts me forever. He loves me. He calls me holy on the merits of Christ. But God as father in a different role. He accepts me forever because I am his child. He loves me forever because I am his child. But he also wants me to experience holiness. To live holily because I am his child. He wants me to be like his son. When he looks at me and I spit in his face by disobeying his word, I am no longer in danger of his wrath. It's not going to get poured out on me. I don't have to cower in fear that I have done something that is going to incur the wrath of God. Because, y'all, every single bit of, Jesus, of the wrath of God has been poured out on Jesus. He took it all. There's nothing left to pour out on me. But... God, my Father, is still pained by my sin because it's not holy. It makes light of the sacrifice of Jesus, and it kills me. And I am his child, and he doesn't want to see me killed because he loves me. Oh, how he loves me. He loves me so much that he ransomed me with the precious blood of Jesus Christ, his one and only Son. He called me his child and gave me a knowledge of him so that I might fear him rightly and obey him from a sincere heart. He desires that I might please him out of the great love that he has given me in response. It is my response because he has poured out his great love upon me. He desires me, be, me to be holy because holiness is what is best for me. And I obey because I love him. 
So ladies, knowing that you are a chosen race, a holy priesthood, excuse me, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Do thus, proclaim his excellencies, abstain from evil, live honorably, be holy, submit to authority, do good, live as servants of God. For he who called you is faithful, and he will work to will and to do his own good pleasure in you. Let's pray. Lord, we give you thanks this morning for your word. We give you thanks that it does not leave us without hope, but it leaves us with great encouragement knowing that I stand righteous before your throne because you have called me your child. These things that you have said about me are true. I am part of the chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. I belong to you because I am part of God's people. I thank you, Lord, that you have given us that knowledge so that from it I can return obedience and gratitude for all that you have done. I pray that you would give us hearts that long for the gospel, that long to render obedience out of love because we have been so greatly loved. Give us your spirit, and by your spirit, enable us more and more to live unto righteousness and to die unto sin, to please you by our acts because you are good, and we desire to live a life in accordance with what you have called us to. Lord, as we walk through this life, I pray that you would lead us on, O King Eternal, to glory. For we ask that you would come quickly, Lord Jesus. We ask it in his name. Amen.